Um, small lots, big ideas, or big ideas on small lots. So the, this, uh, the idea of doing this uh, gathering, this exchange, came about uh, after a few of us, I think after a lecture, we were here upstairs and uh, chatting, and a few of us discovered that we were under the same deadline, and hence that we had entered this competition. And so we started talking about, it'd be fun to do a thing where we flip the stage and the professors uh, are all responding to one prompt and they need to present following the same requirements uh, and the students can actually come and see and be the critics. So, um, so we started very much as a conversation between Daisy and I and uh, here we are. Um, so I'll just give an introduction of the, um, the prompt itself and show you guys who don't know who didn't submit uh, where the site is located. So if we look at the site in Manhattan here and zoom in, the site is a south-facing site. It's um, 17 feet wide, technically 16.6 .6 feet wide. 100 feet um, deep. Then, if we go to the prompt itself, can you guys see that okay? Um, starts out with just an introduction between the collaboration between New York City uh, Department of Housing and Preservation and the AIA in New York, and then moves into some of the reasons why that they were hosting this, this uh, competition, um, saying that there's an inventory of vacant, underutilized city owned land and some of them are very narrow, and the idea that there's uh, a, a crisis for affordable housing. So it stipulates some of the goals of the competition, it gives you the idea that it's gonna be a staged competition, that there's gonna be five finalists, our area of Adam um, Frampton is the finalist, moving into stage two. And um, they announced the winners, or the finalists, uh, sometime in May. And I think probably the most interesting part of this uh, package in the brief is the lengths they go into showing the number of different small, narrow, triangular lots that um, exist throughout New York City. So this is the lot on uh, West 136th Street, and then we move to um, you know what the, what the deliverables are, 5, 11 by 17 pages um, with some additional material at the end. But if you just kind of scroll down, there are all these uh, types of infill lots, attached corner, um, attached interior, shallow, detached, and the list kind of goes on. And the idea was that we um, put forth an affordable model for living and also propose um, on one of these other sites or a couple of these other sites how our model would work and be applied to other, um, to other lots. So you know, these are the lots and they go on for quite a bit. It's so detached, but I think that's the it. So each presenter is going to um, present for five minutes. Five minutes. It will be very strict. Yeah, it will be very strict because it's more about the discussion, but just to kind of give everybody a taste of the images and like what it goes into one of these kind of um, competitions. So we're starting with Jaffer of uh, New Affiliates. I don't have much to say. So. <laughs> don't you worry about time. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I love the spirit of this event, and I'm really glad that you guys did it. So I just want to say that it's rare for those of you who have not had the privilege to practice a lot, which is actually a curse, um, to be able to submit a competition and then talk to other people who've done the same thing. There's a kind of weird veiled cloud of secrecy over the whole process. And so I love the idea of being able to look and share and talk, and even more the idea that you guys can critique us. All of that said, I'm actually not really participating in any of this, because I have to leave in about 10 minutes. So uh, I'm going to my project and then run out of here. So you guys can, you guys can red herring me. You can do whatever you want. I'm the, I'm the strong man of this group. Um, so uh, my name is Joffer. I teach core one here for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and along with my, my business partner, E.B. Diamantopoulou, we have this firm called New Affiliates. Um, we submitted to this competition um, 
because we were interested in engaging some of the issues around uh, the city that we weren't really taking on through some of our own work. Um, and so uh, we're not really experts in this typology. What do I want? Oh, I was, I, yeah, no, I got it. I don't actually, I don't have anything to show or say. Um, so we're really interested in sort of understanding this typology that we haven't yet worked primarily with, um, which is housing. And what our primary goal was, I got this, yeah, I can flip, um, was actually to take an absurd problem and make it even more absurd. Um, so the idea of the infill lot being a super skinny thing, we saw as an opportunity to make even skinnier things within a skinny thing. Um, and the premise was that certain typologies in housing have fallen away as we pursue um, modes of pure efficiency. Um, so the idea of the micro unit to us unnecessarily precludes the idea of, say, the townhouse. Um, so our proposal was all about reclaiming the townhouse as a kind of like micro living organization. And we built the entire thing around this kind of catalog of super skinny um, living arrangements. So here you see like a kind of skinny desk tucked into sort of halfway under a stair, um, skinny hallways that lead to bedrooms, bathrooms that are popping off of skinny hallways. The skinny hallway was kind of the uh, driver of this whole project. And so we started with these, um, yeah, this kind of catalog, and then we built out a kind of spatial proposal out of that that we thought would be a really interesting way of bringing the townhouse back um, instead of making this idea of everything being kind of living on one, one level. So this was our cartoonish diagram of what we were doing. We are taking three townhouses, compressing them into fit this super skinny lot, and we sort of examined how we could subdivide many different lot types um, within the same kind of idea. Obviously this was, we were working to code in our defense, but we knew it wasn't necessarily the most pragmatic response, but we were really interested in, in kind of blending a conceptual approach and a conceptual idea with testing it against the rules of the city. Um, so we were really proud of ourselves for actually just making this work at all. Oh, that's more than enough. Just give me like 10 seconds and I'll just stop talking. Um, so we were really proud of the fact that we were able to actually compress. In this case, we did four units because we wanted to, to have an ADA unit at the bottom, which doesn't quite participate in the super skinny kind of narrow staircase model. Um, so the ground, the first floor is ADA um, compliant. And then there are three of these narrow townhouses that kind of grow up um, from a main entry area at uh, kind of the second floor, or the, the first and a half floor. Um, and as you see, they kind of push and pull against each other all the way up through the building. Um, they accommodate one another when spaces need to grow to take a bed um, or a bathroom versus when they're, they're narrowest as a corridor. Uh, so the three units are there, they work. They're great sizes. Um, obviously, the project finds its most resonance in sections. So um, how do you actually use the typology of the townhouse to create interesting sections of vertical living um, and not just kind of accept the fact that we all have to just be on one f unit per floor? Um, so we got really into the sections and designing through those. Obviously, there's a kind of cross grain. So when you cut the short sections, you see the three banded striation. And when you cut the long sections, as you see here, you see the majority of one unit in each kind of like laminated layer. Um, I think that's pretty much it. The, the outside of the building was maybe the least interesting or least resolved part of our design. Uh, but we sort of observed that the typical townhouse usually has like a set number of bays. We tried to kind of shrink those and multiply them so that you created a bit of a game of uh, understanding that there was something going on with the proportion of the interior spaces um, and to reflect through these sawtooths that there were sort of three bands. That's all. Um, I'm Gordon Gibbing. Um, I teach core two, um, and I'll be back in the spring. I've been here. Yeah, I've been here for uh, over 20 years. <laughs> so, uh, what do I do? Page down, or yeah, okay. Um, so um, we started with um, just four sites uh, that were part of the competition. Um, this is the primary site in Harlem. That's in uh, East New York. Uh, this is Staten Island. And that's another site in Harlem. 
So uh, the primary site in Harlem, uh, basically our scheme could be um, single family, which we did in Staten Island. It could be two duplexes. It could be two um, one bedroom apartments, so one floor each. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just go out and live here. So the, what's fixed is this structural bay. And then to, what gets adjusted is the end bay for, um, uh, to accommodate the different sites. Um, so what in this scheme is a cellar and then there's two duplex units. Um, we used uh, mass timber construction um, for it, it basically uh, the panels, which come in lengths of up to 40, 45 feet, fabricated uh, in a factory and brought to a site on a truck uh, and hoisted into place very rapidly. So something like this would be a three-day construction after a conventional concrete uh, foundation. So you have the vertical panels uh, on the, for the walls, um, glue lamp beams. Again, the width is adjustable per site. Um, the stair units are also uh, cross-laminated timber, the walls cross-laminated timber, and the slabs uh, cross-laminated laminated timber, wood being sustainable um, and, um, you know, it maintains the, uh, the uh, carbon, um, unlike uh, steel or concrete, so. Um, and then as well, ground source heat pump, we're uh, kept catching rainwater, um, and uh, uh, radiant heating and cooling in the flooring. Uh, here's the floor plans. So the, the upper unit here is, when you do it in New York, this is all exactly the code, no, 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 uh, except for the, the CLT, the cross-laminated timber, which is in the process of being part of, uh, allowed as part of the code, but not quite yet. But otherwise, it's, it's code. So from the entry, you go up two floors above the first duplex into the second. In New York City, you can have a two-family house without an elevator uh, accessible by stairs, and that's perfectly legal. The ground floor unit, um, uh, in certain iterations, sorry, I know I'm going to go over, right? <laughs> In certain iterations, the ground floor unit uh, for a full ADA wheelchair accessible unit would be just a one bedroom uh, because, because there's no place for an elevator here. Planted roof and um, moving on. So the interior, one of the beautiful things about this cross laminated timber, again, structural for the walls and slabs, is that it becomes the inside finish and then the glue lamp beams. It becomes the inside finish, so you've got that that healthy air of the, of, of the wood uh, environment. Um, you insulate on the outside, and then in our case, we clad in, uh, in glass reinforced concrete, um, glass fiber reinforced concrete. Um, and uh, each floor, let's see, let me just jump back a second. So each floor, uh, or each, each room, kitchen, dining, uh, living room, bedroom, bedroom, has this kind of Juliet balcony where you can uh, put planting uh, and fresh air. Um, and um, yeah, it's a view of that one up there. Floor plans for the primary site. So uh, uh, again, that's two duplexes, two diagram in the upper right corner. Um, construction details of the cross-laminated timber. Um, so this is the again the primary site on 136. Um, just an exploded axon of the two units, and then further blown out into each of the modules, um, which is totally repeatable and just adjustable by dimension. But the plan maintains the same, stays the same. The um, zoning data that they asked for, uh, adapting the project to a different site. So this is in um, East New York. So it's a duplex ground on the first two floors and then a, uh, the upper residence is a, a one bedroom. And this is the one in Staten Island, it's a single family house, two story. And then this is the other site in, in Harlem on uh, 129th, which starts to play with the plan a little in staggering, you can see the diagram up there, staggering the, um, the floors. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, 
So thanks to Aiden and uh, Daisy for letting me participate. I actually didn't submit to the competition. I had something I was working on and then had the baby you can hear um, crying in the background somewhere. So, so this is the, uh, the recently, uh, sort of still in progress. I mean, because I didn't submit to the competition, it's a little bit in progress. Um, but anyways, I think a little bit, it's funny because Gordon and John sort of set up the problem. On the one hand, it's an exercise and a kind of perverse um, resistance to the, the conventions of the infill lot. On the other hand, I thought uh, we could also do it with mass timber. Um, but basically, there was uh, two competing impulses. The first was to maximize the density of units on the site, um, so it's 10 uh, micro units. Um, the other was to uh, do a courtyard building um, or to carve out the interior of the townhouse and think about alternatives to the railroad. Um, typology, which uh, probably many of us know very well from our uh, own living experiences in New York. Um, and uh, related to this, and, and to those of you who maybe um, were in or um, saw the studio I did in the summer in the AD program, uh, rethinking a little bit the legacy of the new brutalism and a, a kind of um, aesthetic without any uh, affect or, uh, or what the Smithsons might call uh, architecture without rhetoric. So in terms of the, the kind of formal um, expression of the project, unlike much of the work that Alfie and I have done over the past few years, uh, there's no kind of uh, rhetoric of the digital and plain materials and all of that stuff. It's just a kind of diagram of its internal um, organization. Um, so the idea is that there's a kind of standardized uh, core uh, which uh, occupies the center of uh, the lot um, that's consolidated into a nine foot width, which in this lot uh, leaves about six feet of uh, open space, and then there's two kind of generic. Um, loft spaces uh, which extend out from either side of the core, so the core is standardized and repeatable across multiple sites, and then the loft um, spaces kind of reconfigure themselves um, to various sites. And the plan, uh, with the exception of the ground floor, where uh, the, the units become extremely small, and I, I think this is not um, entirely up to code, um, it's not the ground floor, it's a few steps up um, with respect to the ADA problem, but um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, first floor, because in, in this iteration of the proposal, um, allowing a kind of entry uh, through to a collective backyard. So there's a kind of uh, common uh, exterior uh, hall or alley, which could also be used for um, storage of various things and, and allows entry at the midpoint of the building. Um, the units are extremely small, like cont contained to that nine foot width, uh, more like a hotel room um, than a, a typical New York studio. Then up, up above um, the end bays extend across the, uh, across the width of the site. Um, so, I mean, the plan you know, is very kind of compact, uh, spiral stair, um, a bathroom, uh, storage, fridge, kitchenette, and then the kind of flexible space um, for living. And, uh, you know, the one perk is that every uh, bathroom, as well as the stairwell, actually has natural light, um, which those of you who live in uh, townhouse types in New York probably know is um, a challenge. Um, so sectionally, it's uh, staggered because of the, the spiral stair, which uh, limits any kind of um, hallway to compensate for the fact that the center of the building is voided out. Um, with the, the kind of simple core um, repeated in the, the center of the plan, and then the kind of uh, loft, and that's the interior uh, elevation from the courtyard, showing the, the fenestration of the bathroom and the stairs, and the entrance to the project. Um, here it is on different sites, so it, it works I mean, this is probably pushing it a little bit to the 14-foot width, but that would be um, by code, as far as I understand, the interior court um, rules, the limit, um, given that you have to have a three-foot passage to the exterior um, from that interior court. Uh, so 14 feet would be about the narrowest limit. This site's also only 85 feet long, so that everything's getting compressed because of the 30-foot setback in the back. And, and I should say the core is itself 30 feet um, long to uh, offset the, the windows um, and the interior of the loft spaces. But in other um, infill, uh, situations, obviously that kind of lock like space can expand and contract. Um, it also could be uh, reconfigured on an attached corner lot um, where you could flip the facade, the fenestration from the, the end to the, the uh, side or have it on two sides on the, the kind of exposed corner. Um, but what we were most excited about was the idea that these things could start to aggregate into an alternative typology, you know, like the kind of um, sawtooth of the townhouses we have today, um, but with a series of uh, collective voids uh, punched through them. Um, and I mean, those of you who've had studios that I've taught know I'm fascinated by Stephen Hall's um, Alphabetical City um, study of the, the kind of graphic uh, figure ground relationships that developed 
um, in the early American gridiron, the kind of competing pressures of economic development and environmental um, control. And so this is maybe a kind of homage to those um, figure ground diagrams. Um, and that's the uh, very uh, understated interior. So I think that's more or less it. Hi, uh, my name is Alessandro Sini. I teach Core 1 and um, I lead a practice called Park Intentions uh, together with my partner, Nick Rosborough, who is here tonight. Um, so, um, our, our approach to, to this competition was um, purely um, probably theoretical. We wanted to give a response, a typological response to the change of the typology of the townhouse, especially uh, a reconfiguring uh, uh, the floor plan. And in particular, we were interested in analyzing those underutilized um, spaces or elements in the floor plan, um, such as the corridor, the lobby, and then focusing um, particularly on the corridor. So, um, in fact, our proposal is called funny enough, dwelling without corridors, which is kind of the opposite of what Jaffer did. Um, so <laughs> I guess we had to opposite view um, of the same thing. And, and so uh, our, our idea was also um, kind of um, related to, um, to, you know, to the prompt of uh, the few city where the, the public space fuses with the, with, the, with the private space, and that hands the diagram. Below that is more of a urban diagram. Um, so, um, sort of the composition. We, we we try to resolve the composition, the, the composition analyzing historically the, con the the context or the various um, typology of sites, and we built a sort of a taxonomy of uh, typical element, architectural element that there are um, basically composing the facade of the townhouse. So there is the window, the, the, the bow window, um, the entrance, the cornice, uh, the different type of roofs. And then we imagine to repurpose them into extra large elements that were becoming programmatic elements inserted in the facade. So we wanted to try to reconfigure the space, but at the same time give a character to the facade. Uh, so these are um, basically um, conceptual models where the volumes is the absolutely private space and the void in the middle, it's basically uh, the communal spaces because the idea was to create sort of uh, um, two um, duplexes uh, per each floor, uh, one bigger and one smaller, and then with a large shareable space uh, with different functions on every floor. So we have a communal kitchen, we have a communal living room, and a, co uh, a communal library and a terrace. The strategy, um, sustainable strategy, um, well, I mean, these were becoming from our uh, experience on our steady collaboration with Transolar. I will skip the details on that, but we tried to sort of use different type of uh, strategies from, you know, using the thermal massing or natural ventilation or photovoltaic. Uh, some idea of the materiality and construction. Uh, we are currently uh, working on a project that is done in stucco and uh, ceramic. So we were trying to employ the same material uh, to also take advantage of the property of the, of the thermal massing of the, of the stucco, but also the sustainable aspect of using ceramic. So this is sort of uh, um, what came out from this like insertion of this extra large uh, bow window, but then in this case they are not windows, but they become programmatic elements of the duplexes, and so they are not <coughs> fenestration. The fenestrations are part of the different um, sort of paradigm. Um, some study. Well, we we tried. Um, uh, we try to be absolutely strict about code, and so, um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so in the floor plan you can see better that, um, yeah, I'm receiving warning. 
uh, that you know, we, we really tried to develop this idea of, uh, of the floor plan without corridors. And for us, it was um, the corridor is an element that has been introduced in, in, uh, in, uh, in modern time in architecture and, and has been used as a divisive element, um, usually used for also, um, you know, there is a, a connotation attached to the corridor that is socio-economical. And so we wanted to remove that uh, particular um, meaning to, to the layout of the floor plan. So going up, I mean, uh, coming on living room, and then the duplexes. And this is more clear in the section where you can see that there is a, a, a central space that is always communal, and then a larger duplex and a smaller duplex on the side. And that's it. project in collaboration with Gabriel Huerta. Um, sometimes when we have big projects, we come together and um, produce. So, um, the impetus behind this project um, is to compose uh, eight south-facing units and eight north-facing units that are prefabricated, stackable, stack, stackable and um, framed on site. Um, and a really important component of this project is really down here, trying to create as much green space as possible and connect the ground floor, which would be public, to this kind of private green space in the back. Um, there is an elevator and um, there's access through stairwells as well. So it's a, um, it's a project that really tries to think both um, in terms of uh, stacking units in a kind of uh, easy, cost-effective, fast construction process, as well as really kind of designing the interiors of the spaces um, down to the millwork. Um, so this is kind of one slide that offers three potential configurations of the same unit. Um, so we designed the millwork such that on the top right hand side, the, the green unit would be like a living space with um, a kind of pu a pure um, concrete uh, topping slab that would <coughs> Uh, provide heat to the living units as well as a fold down table where you can have many guests over. And then the, four, the third one at the bottom would provide um, a TV and maybe an open environment to the um, bedroom. So all of the kind of details of where the studs would go and the, the millwork all try to kind of reinforce this idea that um, there would be some sort of idea about a pure, a pure, a pure space. Um, but also providing flexibility. Um, the building mass is uh, organized as uh, in two different ways. So one would be just a simple extrusion of the F available FAR, and then another one would be understanding the um, timber volume, which would be the uh, which would house the um, elevator and the stairwell as one element, and then the other element being this green wall. And so the idea behind the green wall really is to like, uh, attract people into the back of the rear yard and also provide people with glimpses of the green space from within the unit. So it really kind of tries to connect a lot of the, the light and the air and a kind of a fluid flow throughout the entire um, building. Um, so we went into the building assembly of these, of these units and also the unit kind of individual fabrication layers of um, uh, prefabrication layers. So um, one of the other kind of studios and um, interests of mine is understanding the full kind of life cycle of, of waste management. So a lot of incinerators um, produce something called a, a byproduct of, of, of fly ash. And so we wanted to kind of think about fly ash being used in this topping slab that would also have <coughs> heat, heating. Um, another area of, of interest and um, excitement is also mass timber, that it would, um, that it would be a mass timber constructed um, fabricated unit, but it also have um, timber columns for shear walls. So we used we uh, collaborated with another uh, structural engineer, Christina Miele, to understand how we would um, 
offset shear in the building and kind of took another layer of, um, of understanding sh um, structure in terms of building assembly and unit assembly. Um, these are some more detailed kind of plumbing diagrams, me mechanical diagrams. Um, one of the kind of, uh, let's see, like subcategories of mass timber is NLT, um, nail laminated timber, and it's a common practice of um, a, a floor in large warehouses in um, uh, downtown. So they really have uh, a way of creating panels uh, similar to CLT but they're actually nailed together. So instead of laminated with glue, they're nailed together, and that would be the, um, the floor that the mass temper unit um, would be craned in on site. Um, this is the floor plans, the basement floor plan. Um, places for storage, trash, and um, mechanical space. Um, ground floor plan, again, kind of like the idea that this would be like a continuous um, stream for community-oriented events to the back. Um, trash and other kind of recycling things are here, bike storage, and ele elevator kind of reinforcing our um, ideas that all of the units should be accessible um, should they so um, need to be. And um, this is the open to below space with the green wall and uh, elevator stair and adaptable living spaces of the section. And then these over here at the bottom. And back elevation. And the crane and on site diagram showing that <laughs> you can, maybe if you want to, build um, further up if you need to. And I think, oh yeah, the wonderful zoning table. Okay, <laughs> skip through that. Adam. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Crampton. My practice is called Only If. Um, and this is our proposal the competition boards um, done together with my partner, um, Carolina Chomchak. So it's a little bit hard to present these, but um, I guess we uh, our project kind of starts um, looking very carefully at the kind of context. Um, we thought that basically um, there would be a real, there was a real concern um, about how to kind of integrate the project. On the other hand, um, <coughs> It's also adjacent to a kind of um, you know early 20th century, late 19th century uh, context of housing, so we um, wanted it to be different. Um, the um, the project here, you can see uh, from this elevation, we reconstructed um, a kind of front stoop as an entrance into the second floor, um, and tried to work through uh, brick and pattern to kind of align to um, adjacent decoration. Um, in our project, we consider um, a little bit, uh, to be honest, actually in the context of a competition, I, I think our, our um, aesthetic perhaps was for sort of a facade without qualities more um, aligned with Emmett. Um, but in the context of a competition, we thought that that might be um, maybe too anonymous. Um, another, another idea I would say that um, kind of motivated our project, um, which admittedly um, is very pragmatic. We're, we're working in the competition in a way more pragmatic way, I think, than I would say we would otherwise, or in other contexts. Um, but I think we recognize that um, you know, within the given site, it's imperative to kind of maximize the density of units. So we have dwelling unit density provided by zoning is eight units. Um, we fit uh, actually seven here. Um, and not simply just kind of packing, um, you know, packing as many as we can, but providing a little bit of sort of diversity of um, unit types and also uh, hopefully residents onto the site. Um, another big idea or small idea is um, to kind of minimize the infrastructure that the building needs. So through really closely looking at um, the code and the kind of requirements for, for instance, for an elevator intervening public corridor, um, we found that actually, uh, although it's possible to create a kind of six-story version of the building, um, we could create also create a four-story version of the building without an elevator. Um, and that would actually yield a similar um, total net area um, of the whole project. Our construction is very pragmatic um, and conventional. Um, we use a, uh, within the plans, which I haven't shown you yet, um, we kind of organize all of the 
uh, storage and um, other uh, things within the unit, kitchens, washing machines, stairs to circulate between levels, is like packed up against one wall, so that they're, we kind of maintain uh, basically clear as much of a clear floor plan as possible. Um, so within these very small units, there's the perceived um, perception of more space, let's say. Um, I won't talk about the replicability. This is our competition submission. I, I think I would guess this page is quite important um, from the perspective of the jury, but I know we're not going to go into it in detail. Um, this is the elevation um, from the front, um, how it fits into kind of context here. Um, and the kind of section, I, you know, just to say that there's sort of a two-story accessible unit because we don't have an elevator, we don't trigger what's called appendix B on the other floors. Um, therefore, leading to kind of more compact and efficient units. Um, two studios, uh, kind of loft studios, and a studio and a um, one bedroom to the roof. The south um, facing terrace is public for all the residents of the building, and um, this one facing north is a little bit smaller for the resident um, over there. So this is ground floor, and moving up through the um, uh, second floor with the stoop. Um, third floor, two studios, and the loft um, on the third floor mezzanine, um, fourth floor, and roof, um, and the zoning. Thanks. Um, okay, we have a vertical uh, layout, so we don't mind it to see. Um, for us, there was something serendipitous in the fact that the lock was just big enough to put two shipping containers in. Uh, our work at Low Tech is very focused on uh, the use of shipping container, and for this project in particular, we thought we both for the, the space uh, and for the ideas of modularity and uh, possibly prefabrication. Uh, it, it was a, an interesting response. Um, we, we developed the project thinking very much about a set of cards, a deck of cards, more than uh, a specific response to this one uh, building as a whole. As a whole. So um, what you see here is all the floor plan and they explore, basically they start from a very simple idea. The entire ground floor and the entire top floor are shared, they are common spaces and they uh, they want to uh, complement the tightness of the small living. Uh, and then uh, we tested different kind of typologies. They go from the uh, two bedroom duplex unit at the bottom, the bottom two levels, and the fourth floor uh, is the one where you can see a little bit the main structure, which is studios on the two sides and a shared uh, dining area in the middle. And then at the very top, there is a more conventional one bedroom. Um, this one would be nice to zoom in, but I don't know how to zoom in. How do zoom in? Um. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. So, I, I mean, I just wanted to show it because for us, the idea of using the container is not just about um, um, convenience in terms of uh, prefabrication or a spatial quality, but there is also an idea of literally using the container. So in this case, we were interested in thinking about the cutouts on the container, not just as a way to make windows on the outside, but also as a way to really engage the interior space. So the, the wall of the containers inside, obviously there are two containers, there are actually four, uh, two 40 footers and two 20 footers, create these filters that sometimes is uh, closure and sometimes is open to what's behind. Um, to obviously in, in the case of the bedrooms. And then, Well, this is, this is just to show the, 
get you of the uh, variety of uh, possibility in the way you combine and recombine, always based on the common spaces on ground and top. Uh, and then uh, the color is uh, also a placeholder. The template of cutouts is a placeholder. The idea is that it's a series of systems that can be applied. We were very interested in the large stock of uh, lots and the idea that this was not something they related just to this specific site but actually could be applied to multiple sites. So at the bottom you see tests done on uh, different kind of geometries that could engage the space in similar ways and then uh, the ultimately tests done on different lots where the cutout uh, can be, the layout can be uh, carried over also to the side uh, for different kind of fenestration as well as a wider lot where we have the opening also on the back. Um, I won't go through these. And then lastly, in the additional material that we could add, we did a series of end sketches that tend to explain uh, more quickly uh, both the idea of prefabrication, the idea of the modular, the idea of upcycling, but mostly really thinking about this shared space uh, and the idea of a proposition for living that is not exactly the proposition for living that is in the hands of uh, developers right now, uh, as well as you know the answers to the question that we have all the time, which is how do you live in a container? You put insulation, so we actually put the insulation. Hello, my name is Benjamin Cadena. Uh, I teach uh, housing studio core three as well. Um, so now that's what to add to this. Um, uh, the proposal was essentially called on common ground, and the idea was to create a series of strategies or components that would add up to a system that could be deployed to different locations across the city, narrow lots, awkward lots, uh, kind of strange geometries in the city. Uh, and the first kind of element was this approach to the ground, uh, which was kind of uh, essential to, to, to kind of the proposal. Uh, this idea that, that uh, the cost or the incident, incidence of cost in doing foundations um, in a small building could be quite big. Uh, and there was a way to perhaps rethink the way the foundations are uh, uh, developed, you know, especially in a small building like these would be quite important. So the idea was to create a a structural system that would offset from the neighboring walls, and in doing so, it would kind of avoid the need to uh, create underpinning, shoring, and other kind of unknowns that happen when you're digging in New York and dealing with existing foundations and neighboring buildings. Uh, and in doing so, they create this kind of support that was almost on ground, uh, of this kind of asymmetrical strap foundation that would support a very light <coughs> steel frame above. And then spanning and kind of cantilevering the structure, you have this very uh, low-cost um, hollow concrete uh, planks that would essentially create the floor slabs for uh, the apartments above. Uh, and the idea is to have this kind of framework above is to have the flexibility to then kind of propose uh, perhaps different scenarios. And it's, it wasn't really thought as a particular building, rather different scenarios that would be applicable to like, different combinations of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, uh, depending on site and different kind of compositions. Uh, and here you can see the different kind of some variations on how the system would fit onto different lot shapes as well. Uh, and then the the other kind of component that was important was this idea of creating an indoor and outdoor uh, uh, relationship uh, to what are essentially very small apartments. Uh, the idea that you could open up your apartment to an outdoor area, even though it's limited, to create that kind of thickened band both in the front and the back. Uh, so it's kind of borrowing a little bit from the vernacular of the existing New York Street, where you have all these kind of fire escapes lining uh, buildings throughout uh, uh, old walk-ups, uh, and kind of creating this thick and balcony space that was uh, screened uh, by these kind of perforated uh, elements that would provide shading, uh, as well as create a little bit of privacy to make these spaces a little bit more usable. So this is a view kind of from the rear. Uh, you have the rear facades of the buildings, uh, a couple of balconies, and then this kind of open ground the second component actually to uh, uh, approach the ground, which was kind of liberating the ground uh, to uh, common uses and 
creating a common use of the reader uh, yard, there was some. Uh, and here's some views of the project kind of from the street, the kind of change it would happen from day and night from this kind of course. Uh, uh, a treatment, which could, again, it's kind of like not as proposal of, of a placeholder. The idea that these elevations could change for different sites, so both the kind of materiality, porosity, or even the shapes could be different, you could a specific character uh, to a building in different places, the kind of cross-section of the building, this kind of central circulation point in the, in the center, and this kind of living spaces on either end. Uh, this is the ground plane, kind of open-ended, connected to the back couple of prototype apartments of uh, floor through apartments, or in the upper levels you have the studio, or a two bedroom apartment. All services or equipment would be then placed up, uh, above, on top, uh, with this, there's no cellars or basement spaces, so all the ground floor would be open. This is also thinking, perhaps in the, the opportunity to place a building such as this in a, in, in a zone where there would be uh, uh, issues with flooding and hazards with flooding. Uh, and these are some of the alternative sites um, try that side. That's all. Super great to hear you guys talk about it because I can look at the PDFs and I pull it in beforehand. But hearing you guys speak about it, I learned so much more too, and also understand how your personalities have taken through in the in the projects as well. Um, I guess the first question that I have is why do a competition like this? Why um, why kind of like risk it? Why put the effort into it? Uh, there are many kind of Layers to doing open call competitions. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll answer it first, and then we can kind of pass the pass the pass the mic. Um, I guess that's maybe one way of doing it. Uh, but for me, um, you know, I, I, I teach housing, and um, I have various like research projects and ideas. Uh, so I've ideas a lot, um, and I think one of the things that um, moved me about this one after vowing not to do competitions is because it's close to home and I felt the responsibility doing it. Uh, I felt that uh, without getting these ideas out, they would just kind of sit with me. And so I think responsibility being one of them and also the responsibility of knowing that I can contribute to a larger discussion given all of the, the kind of things that I'm interested in. Um, I'm just kind of curious how the <coughs> idea of responsibility also plays into your um, practices. The question was why? 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 And, okay, why? I'll get to responsibility. Why did you answer? Um, I make a point of yeah. unless, unless something's extremely interesting, uh, uh, where we're trying to work out um, a problem or an idea. Typically, we'll only do competitions if we think there's a chance of it getting built. And so our scheme was about building to code and, um, and you know, bringing the cost down and realistically uh, uh, proposing a scheme that we felt um, uh, people would want to live in, that was you know, that, that a mixed jury, conservative to um, land use people to design people uh, could appreciate. Um, not, and, and I don't find that a compromise. It was like, by calling it a consensus scheme, I think that all of those constituents can be satisfied, including the residents, of course, primarily. So that, uh, but again, to make the short answer, we, you know, we saw this as a real competition. HPD, I guess, was administering it. They have a track record of building like Eric and Mimi's uh, micro housing, and we thought, okay, they're going to build this one. Let's do it. And responsibility, or was that question? No. no. That's an answer. <laughs> um, well, I think I think I think I took on the competition for similar reasons. Uh, the potential of, 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 of it being realized, and also the way it was framed, it seemed like there was a seriousness to the subject, to the issues at hand, to the idea of housing. It had multiple ways in, I think, and I clearly see tonight there were many different ways into the project, and it was open-ended also, like you weren't quite sure which one to go into. Is it really about sticking to the, to the letter of the law? Are they looking to ways to like you know, subvert it or change it? So that left it open and made it harder to approach, but I think it was interesting to, to to tackle that in a very focused way that you would do. Yeah, I think uh, I also um, share uh, 
you know, I think Gordon and Benjamin's position that it's we're kind of at the point where we want to do competitions that are can be result in actualized projects. Um, and um, actually, for us, I think it was like more that we had to do it because we've been um, we've been thinking about this problem and looking at it for a long time um, before the um, before the before it was identified in Housing 2.0. We did a research project where we mapped um, all 3,600 of these. Uh, vacant, irregular, narrow, small lots in New York City, um, uh, 600 of which are owned by, by, by the city, not just HPD, but other agencies. Um, and then we also have um, a 13 foot four wide house um, under construction right now that we've been working on for like four or five years. So we're like, um, I think it's of the question of kind of, um, you know, irregular leftover land is. Um, very like personal interest in New York City, and it's not. It's just actually because, um, as a young architect practicing here, um, you know, a lot of the ways in which we're addressing the housing crisis right now are through kind of big projects on, uh, you know, big lots by big developers by established architects. So we're also. It's a very. Um, I think just looking at it from our perspective, think how can we get involved in, you know, building here in New York City. You know, the leftover is maybe like a way means to do that. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with uh, what Ben said. Uh, I think that for me personally, I saw it as a multiple ways in into the competition. And probably, if you you know, if you ask in my office, you know, the question, the same question to my partner, that answer will be different. But I saw it actually as an opportunity. To research, we do a lot of competition in the office, and I saw it as the best opportunity to um, actually defeat the paradigm of the developer. I personally was not like, yes, of course, we were trying to make it buildable, and we were interested in making it buildable. But for me, it was just like a research project that could have proved that the paradigm of the developer was not the only one. Uh, following completely on that uh, as well. I mean, I we entered the competition very late in the game uh, because we kept looking at it and thinking like, no, 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 it's, yeah, we're not going to do it. Although, of course, this competition called for our work because our work is very focused on the idea of the small unit of the container and therefore we constantly deal with this narrowness uh, and uh, and, and then I think what kicked in was really uh, this double thing on one hand the sense of responsibility being uh, in practice in New York for 25 years we thought that it, it was right for us to answer and then the other one was also the one of saying can, can we show another way and it's another way in terms of technology of construction another way to think about uh, responding to, to a uh, a problem like this, but also another way in terms of space, like another way to think about the transitional space. Maybe I follow with the next question that would be a little bit of a prompt, which is uh, also very connected and maybe something that I'm particularly interested in, which is in which, in which way a constraint like this is an inspiration. So how, how did you find working on, how did each one of you find working on a tight lot, like in a, on a 16 foot lot where, you know, once you put your core and everything, it's, you're, you're dealing with really, really uh, difficult uh, spatial constraint, what way was that? Something positive, something that generated unexpected solutions or discoveries or... I mean, it's funny, actually, I was talking to David and I, who I think also did the competition, I don't know if they didn't want to present it, but um, about the fact that you could do a very conventional New York City townhouse on the lot. Like, in a way, it's a small lot, but it's actually a totally conventional lot, which could accommodate a high level of uh, variety of, of interior organization within the general confines of the, the townhouse type, as I think the, the uh, various uh, entries displayed. And so I think, I mean, in, in my case, like there was almost an impulse to further constrain it, to force it to become something other than um, what the townhouse typically, or with the, that, say, lot format. Adam, uh, 
correct some of my students for mislabeling townhouses in the summer, so I don't want to get in trouble. But um, uh, you know, we, let's say uh, resisting some of the the conventions of that um, lot type, which is so familiar both in New York and many other uh, American and and other cities. Um, so in our case, it was like a desire to even further constrain it in order to, to find a different kind of typology um, in which the like you know, up, 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 it was obvious what we were doing, but. Um, in which somehow the depth of the lot isn't treated in the, in the typical way. I don't know, for us, I think, um, I'm not sure it was an inspiration, but it was definitely that element, the, co the constraint was that element that made us focus on the vernacular at some point in time. And, and you know, after a while, we were, you know, trying different schemes. Um, those elements, like the bow windows, became like a, a great inspiration. Inspiration that, like, sort of started to resolve things, but also um, let us really go deeper into the history of the technology. And so I think that um, that was like one of the most energetic things. And the constraint is also an interesting thing in relationship to this uh, word luxury that is connected to all new real estate in New York City, right? So the idea of this uh, maybe something that is more modest was also very inspiring for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I naturally have an um, obsession with micro units. The idea that you would actually minimize some of your belongings and try to work within um, you know, the strengths of the city. And um, I think you can tell from my proposal that it's like, I'm a little bit of a purist in that respect, that there might be a kind of a sustainable, environmentally friendly approach towards like how we actually live, like having less and using less. Um, I think that was one of the strength, restraint, constraints of the project for me is just like, how do you take that idea so far that every single inch of your micro unit is designed in such a way that it is absolutely sustainable, not only through mass timber, but the top and slab and the fly ash coming from incinerator. So I think this kind of proposal or, or, or um, competition asks for a level of detail that a lot of kind of competitions, ideas, competitions, other competitions can be um, don't ask, don't ask for, especially ideas competitions. So I think that was one of the constraints or I think opportunities that I was able to expand on that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I found the, 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 the constraints kind of like very productive. I don't know if Spanish is the right word, but uh, definitely made me think of getting to practice in a different way and using structure was actually the starting point, which was weird. I was working with Sylvan and just trying to, what is a different way of doing what people are doing? Uh, and I don't really work, but uh, the idea that you could kind of think about it differently came out of the constraint, which I think was the whole point of the exercise at the beginning. Uh, and also then it became like an exercise of, yeah, producing something that's modest, but it could be nice. You could have like a nice place to live. And having a small lot does not preclude it. And it wasn't that small a lot compared to other cities around the world. It was like, yeah, it's, it's tight, but it's just a little narrow. It's not a big deal. It's like a mindset that I thought was kind of strange to get into New York because we're tied to one way of doing things at certain things that they don't. Yeah, um, maybe a, a little bit of a different perspective. Um, like, what project doesn't have constraints? Like, whether it's a building code or or a program given by a family. I think that like everything is um, is doable, you know, within the constraints that you're dealing with. And but just to to give a uh, kind of anecdote uh, of what not to say to a client. This is in regards to. Constraints. I was I was approached a number of years ago by uh, a division of Parker Pans to do a kiosk, a pop-up kiosk in Rockefeller Center, and it had to be design built. So we had to design it and then construct it, and, and they said, you know, they have one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I guess they talked to some other people and some other designer architects, and 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 people had said, ooh, that's a really tight budget. And they asked me the question, like, do you think that's a tight budget? I.e. A constraint that you have that is challenging. I said, no, no, you could change the budget to ten thousand dollars. I'll go down to the corner, go to the second hand shop, buy a table, and paint it white, and you're done, right? So it's like I didn't get the job. But anyway, the point is that <laughs> given 
a set of constraints, there's always a solution. I mean, if you put a tent on the site, it's a solution. So, um, um, you know, if there was a different uh, set of constraints. So anyway. Um, I guess my question comes also from the fact that because we work with this object that is so constraining, constraining, <laughs> yeah, constraining. Yeah, yeah. you constrain yourself. Yeah, we, we yeah. are constraining ourselves yeah. completely. So, yeah. but I guess we find that incredibly productive. So, I was curious to what way, you know, to what extent that happened also for you guys working on a site that suddenly created like a, a pinch, right? I think, just to follow up, the only, let's say, like to define the constraints based on the code, based on the code, um, you know, we found that it had to be a two-family house unless you put it in an elevator and use non-combustible construction. Okay, so we could have gone that route, but going the no elevator using wood, it says two-family, and so that's not a challenge, it's, it's a two-family house. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's Different less of a challenge, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And it's just the way but it you is. Know, you know, it's interesting it because one thing that we did after, after we submitted the competition, we talked to this uh, uh, young uh, graduate from the real estate development uh, here in Colombia, and they were saying that if you run a financial model for this project, the only way it would work if you do... Ten of you have to, well, either you multiple or you have to do, it needs to be dense. I mean, you need to bring ideas of density inside. So in a way, the two-family house is the least possible from a financial right. standpoint. Okay. So yeah. It's an but, interesting thing. But that's the, the biggest crisis in the city is families being able to live in the city in affordable homes, right? I agree. So you got, like, that's, why, that's why we were set in yeah. thinking that these had to do everything. I mean, you know, in a way for us, the goal was how can this be a place where you can have young people sharing the kitchen space and you can have a family with kids. Right. So we wanted it to be all of it somehow because we felt exactly that, that there is a, an idea also of diversity that needs to be sustainable, not just... I mean, if you have a... Um, a three thousand dollar two bedroom apartment for rent, which maybe a, a, a family with like a working family with moderate income could afford. Um, what they're competing against is three tech workers who each pay a thousand bucks cheap and and turn the dining room into a third bedroom and and pricing out like a you know like a school teacher uh, maybe a single breadwinner or whatever. You know? So that, that's what we were catering to, like housing for our families. I think it's interesting that you're saying, you know, the, the, the problem of the density, because like, you know, density in cities that has been introduced by modernism, like created a lot of, uh, you know, problem um, in itself as a model, but then it's the only way that we can sustain architecture. But then if we go back to the end, to, you know, the, the study of this typology, uh, townhouses were never, um, split it into multiple apartments. I mean, they all totally. that. yeah, it's, it, it was an evolution of the typology. Um, I, um, I I think um, close by where I live, there is a, a specific building that was developed by the Krupp family um, as a sort of a multiple dwelling, and but starting from uh, the idea of the townhouse. And I don't know, it, it's interesting. There are, there are things that uh, we need to bring back into the discourse of architecture um, and trying to understand how we morph the problem of sustaining architecture. Um, because I think that the, you know, the, the density is a problem in the city. I think the density is a good thing. It is a great thing, but to, uh, to a certain level that can be um, sort of housed in a specific space. So, I don't know, um, like density, like especially micro units. I mean, I grew up in a city where we all lived in apartment buildings. There were no townhouses, like the idea of a house, yeah. it's unknown, you know. So. Yeah. For me, it's like we live on top of each other, next to each other, interact with each other, that's all I know. 
That's my only experience of leaving. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something up for discussion. I mean, like, our proposal is a dance proposal. Like, it's, uh, you know, actually a very dense proposal. But, I mean, uh, you know, the idea of uh, sustaining architecture through density is more of, of what I was talking about. And, like, but think about where we are right now, where there is so much construction and so little density because the buildings are almost empty. I mean, exactly. it's an, yeah. it's an yeah. interesting, it's, it's an interesting it, it dichotomy. That's, that's what I was thinking. I think that, I mean, coming back to the, the question of um, constraints, I think actually the, uh, we found that the kind of, um, the 16 foot 8 width was not as much of, of a constraint as the kind of required density. Like in order to kind of really maximize the FAR of the site and to kind of fit all these units in there, that was actually the, the kind of challenge that we kept, you know, running against and trying to, um, you know, trying to kind of work through. So um, it's other projects. The, the 13 foot, um, 13 foot wide one actually has one is a single family house, and that's. Um, very, like totally different project in a way than what we would have done here, and I think um, you know the I, I don't um, I guess we it seems like you know kind of the micro unit is um, probably here to stay. I mean I don't I think it's a it's a kind of um, phenomenon that is um, has of course both pros and cons, and I think I, I really appreciate actually Gordon's ambition towards the kind of family actually. And, Considering that, but I think at the same time we we have to really think about how do these kind of small and compact spaces work for you know as we think about the kind of resources that we use as a society and how do we live in, that, in kind of um, in increasingly in cities and how do we what are the kind of specific things as architects that um, that we have to do to kind of make those spaces more more humane. Are, are we going to get a critique from that? Yeah, I think it would be great. I was trying to pass the mic to see if uh, who wants that. How did we do? <laughs> Destroy yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> more, more. Never mind. Um, I think your works are engaging for sure. And definitely a benefit to society, especially here. I can help you want to know whether or not you are um, permitted to utilize the roofs. And if you are, what would you do with them? We need to utilize what? Roofs. Oh, the roofs. We are using roofs. Yeah, no, yeah. You guys keep the mic. We can answer. Yeah. Who's using the roof in this? We did a green roof. Yes. Just to mitigate. I mean, everybody. Everybody has yeah. a green roof. There's, so. there's certain, like, fire clearances that you have to designate on roofs so that in case of a fire, you, people can go to the roofs and move on to the next roof, their neighbor's roof. So there is, like, Clearances and bulkheads, at least for mine, in the case of the elevator. Um, but pretty much, it's a green roof, and trying to be as like accessible as possible with the little space that we have. We had both a shared space up on the roof, covered, and a shared space open. Um, you know, in a, more in a green roof manner. So I think we're all. I mean, in a space that tight, you really have to use yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. I think that's one commonality between all the projects. Yeah. That are about, like, amazing to see the different approaches actually, used, particularly between like um, uh, Alessandro and um, Jaffer. But the roof, I think, is everybody uses. Adam, maybe you could answer this question, which I think relates to this problem, which is it's interesting. I mean, again, I'm, she's kind of a competition, so may I call it, but um, I wonder from the perspective now of working through it or whether you're allowed to talk about it, the extent to which the city is willing to uh, entertain variances or changes, you know, working outside of the code of the prescriptions, beyond the code of the various agencies that have some kind of jurisdiction over the problem, and to what extent this has to follow exactly uh, the codes that are in place now. Um, and in that sense, like to what extent it can be a kind of test bed for whether it's new programmatic opportunities in spaces that are typically underprogrammed, or whether it's like new construction methodologies or new densities or configurations of units, et cetera. Like, is that something that's on the table from from the um, inside? Yeah, actually. Um, so the um, probably people can. Hear. Yes. Um, the um, so I think our scheme is like pretty much um, complies with the building code and. The zoning resolution we make, um, of course, you can't develop on 
uh, R7A, you can't develop less than an 18 foot wide. Um, you can only develop one or two family with through the loophole that it was uh, existed prior to joining lots on December 15th, 1961, and the date of the filing. So that's the one rule that we kind of break. Um, and I was actually really surprised when we met them because I think some of the other um, the other um, schemes now in the second phase they broke more of the um, you know I think the there's one that kind of breaks quality housing. Um, I was looking at Michael Sorkins. That's pretty Michael Sorkins, yeah, is like pretty much doesn't relate to the quality housing, which is the street wall and the rear yard and this kind of thing. And I guess they're they will entertain. We're, we're, if I had known that, we would have broken broken more rules um, <laughs> yeah. relative to zoning. And I think we will as we um, develop it because it turns out that um, we actually have to go through um, ULERP which is the Uniform Land Reuse use Policy. So it takes three years to just um, basically get a waiver to kind of do the project. And in that process, we can actually um, ask for more exceptions. I think like, like um, Eric's project, uh, Carmel Street, that they're going to use this as a pilot to then change the zoning, um, the zoning resolution after it to allow like more development like this. But I, hopefully we can break more rules. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question, kind of on a similar note to maybe what Evan just asked, but a lot of you um, are responding to the HPD um, prompts, and in just the ways that you presented it tonight, like you all took a very different approach of what kind of way that you responded to the bid itself, and I wonder how much of what your understanding is of what HPD's goals are and kind of really, I guess, how do I frame this question? It's really, a lot of you didn't answer kind of some of the things that they are looking for. Like you can really, if you were to really think through like what HPD is like looking for, and I mean, part of this is interesting because this competition is like kind of unprecedented for them to like really take on kind of hearing different kinds of proposals and I guess my question is like, how much of that kind of played into the way that you wanted to present your project to that very specific kind of city agency client? I don't know if that really makes sense, but yeah. Well, I think, I mean, one, one thing that's interesting about your question is like how to present these things, and I think that was clearly in my mind. Like, what, what is the measure of this competition? What is the value systems for yeah. the rules? But though we do have the code, it's also like, Suggested this is like outside of that to be able to develop something that technically you can't, and which is kind of the spirit of, of the thing. But to what degree and to to what measure it was a big question. So I think I think the variety comes precisely from that focus of what might matter within a set you know set of givens, uh, and I think that's why you have that variety, which I think is what's exciting about seeing the proposals. You get different possibilities, and if you were to consider some of those parameters, what can you do? Uh, so I kind of like that aspect of it, but it was also very really hard to know what the jury was really looking yeah, for. Yeah, I guess I, I asked this because it's like looking back now and reflecting and seeing like who were the finalists, like to be critical about like your own work and like what you maybe would have done differently in terms of how you, like because in a lot of the ideas that you're presenting, a lot of you there's a lot of crossover and overlap and maybe it's the way that you presented that focus that hurt you in the end. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a way that you think, looking at your proposal now, that you would have done it differently. I, I think that the, um, no disrespect, the winning schemes are going to be doing it like we proposed. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but they're going to be watered down. There's not going to be massive variances and, um, and, you know, and, and exclusions to the existing building or zoning code. It's just not going to happen. So a lot of the winners, not yours, but uh, some of the others were, I, I was just like amazed because I've, I've done work with HPD before and, and it's, you know, it's a city agency playing by the rules. So all of a sudden, um, and, but uh, and something else to add, the jury wasn't purely HPD. Mm -hmm. They represented a, a fairly broad spectrum. So. Um, my, I, I would suspect, I don't know if your next round five become one or if all five get to proceed with different lots, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, some of the, the more um, uh, 
uh, unconstrained schemes uh, were brought into uh, more discipline, let's say, within the existing rule structure? Um, for me, I don't think I would do it differently. Um, I went in thinking there's uh, housing prices and I wanted to provide as many <laughs> units as possible and a narrow lot um, isn't for me my, my understanding of where you explore maybe um, a number of different housing typologies coming together or a number of different family structures coming together that there's a really and I was interested in stackable cost efficient uh, sustainable design and the way that I saw that happening was by putting forth micro units and this is a, a place where micro units kind of seem to fit in that that space quite literally and in the micro units I propose that two people live and so if you have eight units you have 16 potential people it also allowed because the elevator two more units so you have 20 people almost um, so for me I don't think I, I would do I would do my model differently I you know, if I wanted to say uh, work within code a bit more, maybe alter some of the sustainable like wood, mass timber, fly ash um, components of it. But I don't. I, I think it's important to push back on some of those constraints as much as you can when you're in practice, because if you're just going to regurgitate the stuff that exists, then um, then that's part of the problem. The competition is always uh, a little bit also an opportunity to flex your muscles. So, and for 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 us in practice, it's, it also happens at a certain time. You're thinking certain things, right? So I'm sure that's true for all of us, right? I don't know if you were thinking about timber. Ed, you've been thinking for timber about timber for a while. So there is, it falls in a moment where the the. The studio, at least that's how it was for us, is already working towards something. So yes, I, I don't know. I we are definitely very much idealists. So I think we look at the jury to just establish a little bit the tone of the competition. But then at the end, you also have to put it aside. You know, you have to think about what is it that you can contribute. What is your vision, and that's the one you can put out, and that's the only one you can. Out. And if they're interested, great. If they're not interested, you move on, and hopefully, you know, test some of those ideas on a different ground. If you can mind this, I don't think you can. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with um, Daisy and Adam. I mean, um, you know, at that particular moment, we spent a lot of time to develop, for example, the micro unit because that's what we thought the. Um, you know, we needed to develop that like sort of weird stackable dense pack uh, inside that uh, weird like sort of uh, arc. And I mean, you you just identify fields of uh, research within the project that you're, you're making, and and then you just uh, stick with that. Uh, it, I mean, realistically, it seems like. The economic viability of all of most things in New York are really real, you know? Like, you can't really buy a house anyways, right? Like, this kind of <laughs> so, like, if the, the micro units versus two really big apartments thing is kind of a fallacy of our current system. And I was a little bit more interested in the fact that if the city does own all these lots, they kind of have the upper hand and kind of flex some muscle in this system that already exists. So rather than playing the micro units versus three reasonably sized units or an actual family, um, I mean, what kind of rules would you guys try to alter? Because I mean, they're the ones writing the rules in the first place for some reason because you keep on patching it over a bit of time and you end up with the piece that we have now. And, you know, like opening up the ground floor to access the entire back or getting down to the middle and going up, like, I don't know, but what kind of things would you guys propose to actually change you know, the things that actually kind of put you in the same box where everything kind of winds up looking like a flavor of vanilla because you're right, they're going to paddle it and sort of fix the thing that they know. But it seems like this is one of the few opportunities that the city has to actually give a flex so opportunity to change things for the better of people actually being able to live in the city properly and make it mildly economically viable because they can actually be multiplying a uh, framing system or 
something a bunch of times and get the bones there so you can create architecture that actually is architecture? I would probably, this, this site maybe suggest, um, as far as a change in the building to it, maybe this backyard setback, I felt like that really kind of um, allows all of the units to, uh, allows all of the buildings to be very front loaded. And I think that there might have been an opportunity to pull maybe eight, four of the units, say, might be four of the units to the back and open up the center. Um, a little bit more. Um, I actually talked with a, my expediter um, about the scheme, and he's like, there's no reason why you can do this. If, you're gonna, if it's going to be a competition, you should put forward an idea about the lot that you actually believe in. And if these units can get both front and rear light, then why wouldn't you do that? Both unit, both, both um, <coughs> separate individuals put two towers on the site. And I was like, yeah, but there's like a setback. And he's like, what setback? He's like, you, you determine that. And this is coming from an expediter who, who goes over code for me when I sit at something in the apartment building. And so already, I, I think coming from somebody who knows the code very well and also is pushing further against what's possible and being potentially more inventive than I was in the moment, I was like, oh, OK, there are things here that I'm I'm just taking for granted as like fact and and, and um, not pushing back on, starting with that setback. So I think that there's a lot of potential between, you know, uh, spreading using the whole 100 feet of the site. That's my that's my code <laughs> code against code. This is maybe a slight tangent, but I, I related to the question uh, or some of the content of the question. I mean, I feel like there's a, in general maybe a a kind of uh, moralizing dimension to the conversation of micro units versus family units or collectivity versus individuality. And I, I would just say, in the context of uh, uh, particularly the housing studio, but work on housing in general, I find that problematic that we always value the collective and increasingly the family over the individual. I think people are alone for much more of their lives. That's not necessarily uh, imposition, but it's a choice. And there's great, uh, I think, desire among many people to have the freedom to live alone, which is something that's incredibly difficult in New York, actually. So I think there's the kind of potential to rethink um, that uh, somewhat conventional. Okay, I got to come at you for that. All right. You know, <laughs> I mean, America founded on like I'm not paying. You know, I'm giving the queen half my wheat. It's my land. I got my gun, and I'm not paying taxes. Right. But, yeah. The individual. So we're here. Yeah, I'm a foreigner. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and so I'm not. I'm, I'm a Canadian, and, uh, and I, I'm with the program. I'm here. But there, it's, it, there's a crisis, right? And I think that that things are shifting to more interdependence as opposed to independence, to community versus this is my damn piece of land because we have a sustainability problem, right? It's like we want to share resources. We want one sewage pipe for five families, not one sewage pipe for one person. We got, we got a problem with like tech workers, finance workers coming into the city, uh, you know, making their 150K a year that architects will not, straight out of school, and, and taking the housing stock. Now, that, why do you think all the cops come from Staten Island or from like Long Island? It's because you can't afford to live in a damn city, right? With a normal, like, as a normal working person. Um, and that kind of goes with teaching at Columbia, too. <laughs> and, and running competition, like, work in, you know, like joining a competition like this is like, you know, it, this yeah. thing cost me 30 grand to, to enter, right? I have to pay people. They don't volunteer for the love of it, for testing ideas, right? So, I mean, on, on Anyway, I'm going off on tangents, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it was a kind of similar, like, I think the map is not one person, one piece of land, or 15 people, one piece of land. It's like 15 people living individually on a piece of land, or 15 people living in some kind of collective configuration on a piece of land. I think, for some reason, we are, these days, always defaulting to the idea that the, the collective structures are the better ones, and there's a kind of moral dimension to that. I would just question whether there might be uh, a kind of value in or a freedom to choose to live individually in high densities, as I think many of the projects suggest, um, 
that is as uh, as valuable as yeah, it's not to say that of course we don't provide housing for families, but not that everything always comes back to the family as the kind of uh, primary motivation. Yeah, and I think I mean just add, add to that. I think I mean I think that's a little bit of the reality. You know, people are actually living in a city like New York. Huge percentage of the people are living alone by choice, design, or because they have to. It doesn't really matter, but that's a reality. So I think taking morality or, or a kind of opinion out of it is actually important in housing because there's things that are at play, whether we like it or not, or we believe that that's the way people should live, that it's, you have to deal with it. And I think you have housing for all these kinds of uh, types, whether it's large families, it's single people, or but whatever. We that's the problem, we don't have. No, but, but, but basically good. saying that like li people living alone is a huge percentage of the actual population of the city. And it's actually going to get worse. So when and you try to like the city a lot less when it does become. Well, it's not my opinion whether I like it or not. But it's a reality. If you don't house people well, they'll figure out a way to do it poorly. Or the quality of life will suffer. Um, so I don't think there should be any kind of moralistic view. I'm not moralistic. I'm, I'm <laughs> realistic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not moral. Um, these possible combinations within the units, but also I was very interested in the idea of the shared space. You know, what does it mean for a building this small to offer spaces that are a vent, right? Where you really might want to go there. And, uh, you know, thinking about the stoop, for instance, like the culture of coming together and trying to push that culture, try to see if there is a way to create an incentive for that culture. And for me, it was in connection both to the just social exchange, but also to natural elements, which is a thing, one of the things. So I, before I talked about, I love density, but, uh, but I feel that instead, the compression of never being in relationship to the elements, you know, to green, to wind, to rain, to soil, to being able to dig something, uh, I think is a real, a, a real cut that we have. So I was more interested in trying to explore that. You know, if there was a way in which quality and something else could be uh, triggered by the presence of these other. What's well, a huge emerging typology with co-living, like with we live and, and the collective? I think there's a bunch of them popping up everywhere, where you essentially. Uh, there's some in Scandinavia that are family-oriented shares, like mm -hmm. communal living. Yes. But here, what some are doing is like more of the individual who have your bedroom and maybe a bedroom and a bathroom, but your all the shared spaces are um, are uh, or sorry, all the kitchen and living rooms are, are shared. Kind of like a dormitory. I mean, I, I don't know. I grew up in a building that was super varied, you know, both socially, structurally. Uh, I mean, in, in so many ways. So for me, this that kind of model of layering uh, remains very relevant. And when I think about this a city and life in the city and the things that we love, one of them being diversity in every way. Yes. So how do you promote that, right? I mean, um, that's a little bit how we came up with this idea of dwelling without corridors because typologically in the historic architecture when the corridor becomes uh, loses the dimension of the corridor becomes a gallery and the gallery is a space that historically is designed to watch into another space and that's how we came up with this idea of um, the, com the communal and then we started to think, well, we don't really live anymore uh, like, you know, um, 50 years ago. Uh, so the notion of the living room, we were trying to really um, push against this notion that the living room is the living room with a, with a coffee table and so on. But uh, we were trying to build a model that was more a shareable model where different type of people and different type of structural um, social system could have interjected into the same space. And that's a little bit what, um, you know, why the corridor came into place. Other criticisms, guys. Come on. This is your chance. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for sharing all of this. 
I'm asking this question as, you know, you know, as, as an architect, because I work as an art curator in contemporary art. So I'm more concerned about um, the visual qualities of the, of the you know, piece of architecture in this sense, and, and the kind of relationship that this device can create with common people passing by uh, in the block. So there is a lot of uh, architectural qualities when you guys have mentioned all the interiors and how you guys articulated uh, techniques, the division of the space, the development of the experience that you can have inside, which are all qualities that, of course, the clients can enjoy. So not everyone can, can have access inside. So my question here is, um, do you have, um, what's your position about creating an architectural device that can be, you know, have a kind of aesthetic that can talk with the people and can be a piece of public uh, object that people can even just enjoy visually because uh, actually the facade that people can have access uh, in terms of everyone. So what's your position on creating a device that can challenge the architecture today, can uh, change the city, leave a sign and expanding the boundaries of uh, architecture as a uh, industry? I don't know if it was clear. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, it's a good I'm, question and a tough one. Yeah. A little bit about the uh, outership. <laughs> <Also, laughs> it's uh, a question also about outership. You know, like your yeah, outership. 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 Yeah, outership. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, being the one that designed the yellow building with the round yeah. facade yeah. made out of steel, I I don't know if I, in a way, I don't want to answer because I think that my answer is there already. I, I actually appreciate the question because I think that's actually one of the difficult things in a competition like that is that precisely because we are all, or some of us, are really trying to get to a project, we're not just doing it because we like to design, uh, we have to think hard about what the parameters are and we have to think hard about how we can get through. But at the same time, we don't want to let go of the ambition to do something that does precisely what you're saying. That is a statement, that is uh, architecture as we think individually. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I can only tell you that for us, this project fit perfectly with a uh, moment of development of a uh, bigger idea of how we modify containers, which is translated in especially the cut uh, system of the windows, and that's what we try to replicate also on the other ones. And it seemed to be a really strong fit also with the idea that this is not a single lot. There are many, 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 many. So much so that I am almost bummed that the idea that HPD that is following this model where at the end, in stage two, you have to become your own developer, is only assigning five. They should assign a hundred of these loans, right? I mean, why are they assigning five? It seems so shy from an agency, right? I mean, they want, they want you to develop it. They want basically the architect to take charge also of the understanding of the financial, uh, package and everything else to push it forward, it seems so sad that it is like this tiny little test pilot, you know, like that yet is going to run for three years minimum to go to Europe. So, yeah, we are, but I think, like, it's a, just to kind of come back to the question, too, like, I um, wanted to point out because I think, and this is what, um, you know, all. Um, what, 400, whatever, people who entered had to draw each of these elevations, like, the inefficient. In, inefficient, yeah, yeah. Inefficient. but there's something really interesting that I figured out through that, is that actually the, how, maybe it's best on Alessandro's elevation, the house on the left of Alessandro's building, the house on the right of Alessandro's building, and the house to the right of that, 
it's a copy of the same building. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also housing, and so there's an element of the kind of generic in the everyday. And in housing, we talk less, I think, about authorship or of the architect and, and this kind of thing. And I don't. I felt very conflicted about that, and I really also um, what Emmett was kind of saying about the authorless. I mean, the kind of authorless project, maybe. Um, I also empathize with, and I um, maybe kind of alluded to it that we felt. I felt a kind of personal conflict about. Um, of those two elevations that I showed, that maybe one which is based on a kind of generic three bay structure that you see everywhere else on every, you know, that that was a more appropriate solution. But on the other hand, in the context of a competition where you're being judged superficially in a very quick way by a jury with limited time, that one needs to kind of um, have more expression. But whether that expression you know, how, I guess we'll find out how that, or if that expression, what that means to kind of people who live there. To, so. I, I think there's many ways to answer your question, and many of them contradict each other. And you know, in my opinion, I could believe in a number of them. Uh, for instance, uh, delight, right? Like aesthetic delight uh, of this of this building, not just to the inhabitants, but to people passing by. Um, we could say if we are investing as practitioners in this competition with a desire to build for greater good, you know, um, and we look at the at the values that we feel we're going to be evaluated on, it, like aesthetic delight is not one of them, right? So another answer which completely contradicts is is um, if you pursue like the, the, the objectives, you know, housing the family, sustainable construction, natural light, green, you know, all these things, just in a very pragmatic way, delight comes, right? It's not like, like a forced gesture of formalism for form's sake. Okay, another one. So that's, you know, those two kind of contradict each other in a, in a sense. Another one, like my favorite picture of Bill Bow, right? It's like this view down this this um, uh, old street, and then this this uh, you know bent metal, smooth, beautiful, shining thing at the end, a complete juxtaposition, um, and it's gorgeous, right? Uh, um, and gorgeous in juxtaposition. I don't think Frank Gehry himself would want a city of build outs, right? It, it, it works because there's a dialogue taking place. When he's working and there is no context, he creates blocks as part of his building in order to do this, right? So, um, and again, not completely answering your question, but like, like there's, I guess, uh, a commentary on delight in architecture and against, let's say, uh, a context. So, yeah. I think just speaking to like the architectural moves that um, our project um, used, it was increasing the the height at the entrance, and it was canting the floor plan for publics for people from um, the sidewalk to come in all the way through to the back. So there are these things that I think, you know, like architecture communicates and there are gestures that you can make so that your project does seem to uh, appear inviting. And, you know, because they're micro units and because there's likely not like a lot of families and activity around potentially, that component of outdoor space and collective space and a place where you can grill and you can picnic and was a very important part of our proposal. So it, it really felt like it spoke to like offsetting some of the ideas about um, about being insular and isolated in a pure state. That there was this kind of moment where like the green could be overthrown and chaos could kind of ensue if needed. I think I think for me like I did think a lot about it in the competition and I thought it was an opportunity with modest means to do something with character. And I think the issue of like being characterless or authorless and having character or not, however you want to frame it, I think it is important to consider like 
we want something that's supposed to be affordable or should be kind of replicated or, you know, like there's some other measure, another thing in play that's not what's visible perhaps. Uh, I think it's also important to see what we're producing because if everything is generic, if everything is banal, this is the problem we're seeing everywhere. And it's not about one city, it's about every city, every place has that problem in aggregate. I could be anywhere now. And it always feels that way. So there's also an opportunity to introduce something that might be slightly different. Maybe it develops into a character, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it accrues in numbers. Uh, but maybe it's distinct to that place. Maybe there's an opportunity to do something else somewhere else. And I think, I think it's important to think about that too. And it's not about you know, necessarily pure kind of surface or pure <coughs> just enjoyment for enjoyment's sake. I think places, you know, even modest places should have a modest kind of identity that's, you can take the money I would just say, I think there's a difference between generic and banal though. I think what's banal in the city, in cities globally and in New York City where we are now, is the attempts at character that are either sort of clumsy or watered down by the economics of the kind of lack of craft and construction or otherwise. I mean, I would say that especially in the context of housing, something that was truly generic would actually uh, be the closest you could come to replicating the qualities of these blocks, which I presume we're all sympathetic to, mm -hmm. um, within which there's then the possibility of invention, but you would have to arrive at something generic first instead of, uh, I think what, like if, if you, I mean, I'm sure other people have this, um, feeling, and uh, this is what I'm trying to teach increasingly, is like, it, it's clear that most buildings would be better at the state of 90% completion, and there should be the capacity and the discipline to accept that as the result, the kind of pure expression of internal structure and material, the, the actual necessity, like material necessities of construction, and avoid the need to do something interesting at the end, which is, you know, 99% of the time offensive. Yeah, and I, th I think that, just to add, I totally agree, I mean, I think that the kind of, um, the genericness of the surroundings, or the, it's also like highly, sp it's, it's kind of highly specific, that, that type, and it's like, whether it's 16 foot 8 or 20 foot, more typical, like 20 or 25 foot lot, it's like, um, it's all based on, um, you know, the type of construction, the, you know, um, masonry, bearing walls, the width of uh, the timber that comes from the added ornaments, the Catskills, the color of the brownstone that is, you know, you can see in like these projects is based on the New Jersey, the clay that they're using, in New Jersey. you know, all these things are like actually highly specific in a way, um, and give the kind of character to the sort of, you know, everyday architecture that one sees in, in neighborhoods like this. But one could argue that that's a very conservative position that you're taking. I mean, to me, it is yeah. a very conservative position. And I have a problem with the idea that, that that's what an architect does. I mean, I, I always wish that there is more intention, there is more, uh, more, more effort, more, which doesn't mean that extravagant, necessarily but, yeah. extravagant, but it means more ambition, maybe. Yeah. No, maybe not a level of construction, which then is I mean, I think that's what I'm saying. Why the level of construction yeah. too? I mean, I think also at the level of construction, because why do we only have to build as we built for 2,000 years? Yes. I mean, Frank I would Kula, argue that we can build in other ways. Kula says, if, it does, if the roof doesn't leak, the architect didn't try hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ambition, right? Yeah. If it tries yeah, something new, it's, it's going to leak. Yeah. <laughs> Which just, position? Um, just the sort of like authorless, like it seems to ignite a lot of attention. And there's something literally refreshing about hearing someone say like, you know, have, have a position on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, that, that's exactly the point. Well, yeah, I mean, even in our case, that seems like we used vernacular elements and we made them bigger or we changed their proportion or materiality, that could seem to be like a sort of a, an attempt on uh, a mimetic kind of ideas because we were thinking like, okay, well, these lots can be in different sides and maybe it's, it's a landmark neighborhood and so on, but it was not actually an attempt on being mimetic with the neighbor, but uh, with, the, with the neighborhood, but it was really an attempt on reconsidering 
the, the language of the facade. Uh, I have one for the question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the So my question is regarding the uh, materials. Um, now I heard timber, um, the, the container. I think about it in the noise, in the noises, uh, long term. Like, have you guys thought about that? Because I feel like the biggest challenge that I have to do in constructions is that you can hear everything your neighbor is doing, and you just. You don't become so friendly, you kind of hate your neighbor, you don't even want your kids to go play with the next person. So is that something that you guys thought about when you were using the materials? In our case with noise, yes. it's um, cross-laminated timber, so it's not like hollow wood cavities. Okay. It's like you take a one by four solid wood and you line up a whole row of them and then you take another row of them perpendicular. Okay. And then you do perpendicular again, so you do three or five layers, and it, because it's running in both directions, it can be as strong as, as concrete, for example, and it's quite dense. But typically, and what we propose, uh, and again, typical detail is to top it with two inches of concrete um, to give it some mass, which, for acoustic reasons, um, will not allow sound to transmit. In our case. What are the limitations of your rescue? Say it again. What are the lead? Limitations to your recipe of cross lamination? Uh, the lead, like. Uh, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that they give points, and I'm not a. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a lead uh, fan. I'm not certified. I'm not a fan because I've seen it uh, in the course of real projects um, um, be counterproductive in order to get those points. I mean. Every project built in Manhattan, due to density, proximity to transportation, you're, you're three quarters of the way there already, right? And then you start, the example I was giving is we had a lighting designer in a kind of museum, or, or an office within a museum context, who said, we don't need task lighting because uh, the overhead lighting is sufficient, but we need the point, so go buy lamps. Right, you know, it's like just stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. So is sustainability a useful guideline? Absolutely, but lead is like a point system, you know, and then you get products. certification. So connected to yeah. product, yeah. yeah. Connected to product, so it has a very different. Like yeah. Okay. All right. We're gonna wrap it up. We need to. Yeah. 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 Yeah.